cry not yet. There's many a smile to Nondam, with city maids per man, sir, and the park so dark by kindlelight. But look what you have in your hand, self. The movables are scrawling in motions, marching all of them ago in pit-pat and zing-zang for every busy eerie's wig, a bit of a Tory tale to tell. One's upon a time and two's behind their letter sleep, and three's among the strubbly beds. And the chicks picked their teeth, and the donkey he begay began. You can ask your ask if he believes it. And so, cuddy, me only wallops have heels. That one of a wife with the faulty barnets. For then was the age when hoops ran high. Of a no arch, and a chop wife, of a palm full grave, and a fanny of levity. Or of golden youths that wanted gelding. Or of what the mischievous miss made a man do. Mal married dad, he was reverso gassed by the frisks of her frasks, and her pretty piddick may fay. She's le gay, this snaky woman. From that trippery, toe expunding pellet. Veil, Valentine, Valentine eyes. She's the very besh when he blows, nay on good. Flow in, flow an. Oh, sure, so it's sure it was her, not we. But lay it easy, gentle. <laughs> What we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And every phrase and sentence that is right, where every word is at home, taking its place to support the others, the word neither diffident nor ostentatious, an easy commerce of the old and the new, the common word exact, without vulgarity. The formal word, precise, but not pedantic. The complete consort dancing together. Every phrase and every sentence is an end and a beginning. To begin at the beginning. It is spring, moonless night, in the small town, starless and Bible black. The cobble street silent, and the hunched quarters and rabbits wood limping invisible, down to the slow black, slow black, crow black, fishing boat bobbing sea. The houses are blind as moles. Though moulds see fine tonight in the snouting velvet dingles, or blind as Captain Cat, there in the muffled middle by the pump and the town clock, and shops in mourning, the welfare hall in widow's weeds, and all the people of the lulled and dumbfound town are sleeping now. Hush! The babies are sleeping. Not you, obviously. The farmers, the fishers, the tradesmen and pensioners, cobbler, schoolteacher, postman and publican, the undertaker and the fancy women, drunkard, dressmaker, preacher, policeman, the webfoot cocklewoman, and the tidy wives. Young girls lie bedded soft or glide in their dreams with rings and trousseau, brides maided by glowworms down the aisles of the organ playing wood. The boys are dreaming wicked or of the bucking ranches of the night and the jolly rogered sea, and the anthracite statues of the horses sleep in the fields, and the cows in the byres, and the dogs in the wet-nosed yards, and the cats nap in the slant corners or slope sly streaking and needling on the one cloud of the roofs. You can hear the dew falling and the hushed town breathing.
if, and the thing is wildly possible, the charge of writing nonsense were ever brought against the author of this brief but instructive poem. It would be based, I feel convinced, on the line in page four. Then the bowsprit got mixed with the rudder sometimes. In view of this painful possibility, I will not, as I might, appeal indignantly to my other writings, as a proof that I am incapable of such a deed. I will not, as I might, point to the strong moral purpose of this poem itself, to the arithmetical principles so cautiously inculcated in it, or to its noble teachings in natural history. I will take the more prosaic course of simply explaining how it happened. The bellman, who was almost morbidly sensitive about appearances, used to have the bowsprit unshipped once or twice a week to be revarnished, and it more than once happened, when the time came for replacing it, that no one on board could remember which end of the ship it belonged to. They knew it was not of the slightest use to appeal to the bellman about it. He would only refer to the naval code and read out in pathetic tones admiralty instructions, which none of them had ever been able to understand. So it generally ended in its being fastened on, anyhow, across the rudder. The helmsman used to stand by with tears in his eyes. He knew it was all wrong, but alas, rule 42 of the code... No one shall speak to the man at the helm, had been completed by the bellman himself, with the words, And the man at the helm shall speak to no one. So remonstrance was impossible, and no steering could be done till the next varnishing day. During these bewildering intervals, the ship usually sailed backwards. What do you see now? Globes of red, yellow, purple. Just a moment. And now, my father and mother and sisters. Yes. And now, knights at arms. Beautiful women, kind faces. Try this. A field of grain, a city. Very good. And now? A young woman with angels bending over her. A heavier lens. And now, many women with bright eyes and open lips. Try this. Just a goblet on a table. Oh, I see. Try this lens. Just an open space. I see nothing in particular. Well, now. Pine trees. A lake. A summer sky. That's better. And now? A book. Read a page for me. I can't. My eyes are carried beyond the page. Try this lens. Depths of air. Excellent. And now? Light. Just light. Making everything below it a toy world. Very well. We'll make the glasses accordingly. What did you think of that, Sebastian? How many will you see? An introduction to the annual Great Backyard Bird Count. Every February, all over the world, people count the birds in their own backyards. After counting for as little as 15 minutes, they upload their data to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the National Audubon Society. Researchers compile the sightings to calculate a real-time snapshot of bird populations, migratory patterns, and species health. Scientists can't be everywhere, but as citizen scientists, we can help. 
last year, 180,384 people counted 28,875,960 birds. In 2019, the 22nd Great Backyard Bird Count will take place February 15th to 18th. Patty Wainwright and Johan Eriksson will share their experience with identifying birds on Peaks Island and encourage us all to participate in the GBBC. They will go over the process of registering for the Great Bird Count, filling out the lists and submitting our counts to the website. They will answer your questions about birds on Peaks Island. Sponsored by the Friends of the Peaks Island Library and the Library of Library Peaks Island Preserve. Please ask your doctor if bird watching is right for you. Okay, I made up that last part. Now entertain conjecture the time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire, and through their paley flames each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed threatens steed in high and boastful neighs, piercing the knight's dull ear. And from the tents, the armourers accomplishing the knights with busy hammers closing rivets up, give a dreadful note of preparation. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice. And chide the crippled, tardy gated knight, who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor, condemned English, like sacrifices by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger and their gesture sad, investing lank lean, cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon, so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry, praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes, and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of colour unto the weary and all-watched night. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. He was very much admired indeed. He is as beautiful as a weathercock remarked one of the town councillors, who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic tastes. Only not quite so useful, he added, fearing lest people should think him unpractical, which he really was not. Why can't you be like the happy prince? asked a sensible mother of her little boy, who was crying for the moon. The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything. 
I'm glad there is someone in the world who is quite happy, muttered a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. He looks just like an angel, said the charity children as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. How do you know, said the mathematical master. You have never seen one. Oh, but we have, in our dreams, answered the children. And the mathematical master frowned and looked very severe, for he did not approve of children dreaming. If you cannot understand my argument and declare it's Greek to me, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you claim to be more sinned against than sinning, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you recall your salad days, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you act more in sorrow than in anger. If your wish is father to the thought. If your lost property has vanished into thin air, you are quoting Shakespeare. If you have ever refused to budge an inch or suffered from green-eyed jealousy, if you have played fast and loose, if you have been tongue-tied, a tower of strength, hoodwinked, or in a pickle, if you have knitted your brows, made a virtue of necessity, insisted on fair play, slept not one wink, stood on ceremony, danced attendance, laughed yourself into stitches, had short shrift, cold comfort, or too much of a good thing, if you have seen better days or lived in a fool's paradise, why, be that as it may, the more fool you, for it is a foregone conclusion that you are, as good luck would have it, quoting Shakespeare. If you think it is early days and clear out bag and baggage, if you think it is high time and that this is the long and short of it, if you believe that the game is up, and the truth will out, even if it involves your own flesh and blood, if you lie low till the crack of doom because you suspect foul play, if you have your teeth set on edge at one fell swoop without rhyme or reason, then to give the devil his due if the truth were known, for surely you have a tongue in your head, you are quoting Shakespeare. Even if you bid me good riddance and send me packing, if you wish I was as dead as a doornail, if you think I am an eyesore, a laughing stock, the devil incarnate, a stony-hearted villain, bloody-minded, or a blinking idiot, then, by Jove, oh, Lord, tut, tut, for goodness sake, what the dickens, but me, no buts, it is all one to me, for you are quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> Socks, bucks, knocks, knocks in box, fox in socks, knocks on fox in socks in box, socks on knocks and knocks in box, fox in socks and box on knocks, chicks with bricks come, chicks with blocks come. Chicks with bricks and blocks and clocks come. Look, sir, look, sir, Mr. Knox, sir, let's do tricks with bricks and blocks, sir. Let's do tricks with chicks and clocks, sir. First, I'll make a quick trick brick stack. Then, I'll make a quick trick block stack. You can make a quick trick chick stack. You can make a quick trick clock stack. And here's a new trick, Mr. Knox. Socks on chicks and chicks on fox. Fox on clocks, on bricks and blocks. Bricks and blocks, <coughs> bless you, on knocks, on box. Now we come to ticks and tocks, sir. Try to say this, Mr. Knox, sir. Clocks on fox, tick. Clocks on knocks, tock. Six sick bricks, tick. Six sick chicks, tock. 
Please, sir, I don't like this trick, sir. My tongue isn't quick or slick, sir. I get all those ticks and clocks, sir, mixed up with the chicks and tocks, sir. I can't do it, Mr. Fox, sir. I'm so sorry, Mr. Knox, sir. Chapter One Monsters A to Z. This book contains hundreds of creatures for use in any Dungeons and Dragons game. Refer to the glossary, starting on page 305, for definitions of common features and abilities of individual monsters. In most cases, a monster entry describes a typical individual of the kind in question, which is the most common version encountered by characters on adventures. The DM can modify these entries, create advanced or weaker versions, or alter any statistics to play a monster against time and surprise the player. And now, let's meet the monsters. A. Aboleth. The cool, refreshing water suddenly erupts in a storm of reaching, grasping tentacles. The tentacles connect to a primeval fish, 20 feet in length, from its bulbous head to its crescent-shaped tail. Three slit-shaped eyes, protected by bony ridges, are set, one on top of another, in front of its head, which remain just beneath the surface when it attacks. The aboleth is a revolting, fish-like amphibian found primarily in subterranean lakes and rivers. It despises all non-aquatic creatures and attempts to destroy them on sight. An aboleth has a pink belly. Four pulsating blue-black orifices line the bottom of its body and secrete grey slime that smells like rancid grease. Sebastian, this is an apple. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not that rancid, really. I'm misunderstood. At the far end of town, where the grickle grass grows, and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows, and no birds ever sing, excepting old crows, is the street of the lifted Lurax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today. Where the Lurax once stood, just as long as it could, before somebody lifted the Lurax away. What was the Lurax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere? From the far end of town where the grickle grass grows. The old Wansler still lives here. Ask him. He knows. You won't see the Wansler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on the top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of mid-muffed moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters, and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lurax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. Are you willing to pay? Or am I reading this for free? <laughs>